Welcome to the My Personal Football Coach Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, Episode 50, Part 2 with Chris Ramsey. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, this is uh, the 50th show, part two. So to celebrate the big 5-0, I wanted to uh, split it into the two uh, fantastic episodes and part two really is uh, not going to let you down. It's amazing. Uh, so proud to have uh, Chris Ramsey on the show who really is uh, one of the, if not the best player developer, play developer in the country. Uh, really is a visionary uh, I've had him on before. I want to get him back on. Just obviously, you know, look, he's a really important part. Played a really important in my part in my career, and he is really one of the best. So uh, to celebrate the big five zero, getting him on was a, a real compliment, compliment, accomplishment for me. And just look, I wanted to just say, you know, to share Chris's knowledge with uh, everybody out there because he really is one of the best. It's interesting, you know, we we're chatting on this on this podcast, and he says, you know, how he's. Uh, Got, he works at the best academy in the world and I was a bit like whoa hang on you know and he said well I've got the best philosophy in the world and you know the more I think about it the more I think he's right you know work he does now at QPR and he's at Tottenham uh, in terms of development it's the best philosophy out there you know there's nothing better in it in terms of you know uh, player development and uh, developing the child as well so uh, really honoured that he's come back on the show I'm now going to enjoy it no, it's a big 5-0 it's been a long road Obviously, it's a strange time at the moment, uh, but listen, uh, too many clubs to mention now. We've had so many clubs sign up in the last uh, couple of weeks. I just want to welcome everybody to, uh, to the My Personal Football Coach Club partnership. Obviously, look, we've got the app uh, you know, and everything. that We're adding uh, weekly content as well, so every week there's new content on the app, so players can do the course. Players can also upload their own content now and share on the team library, so it adds a bit more interaction. And obviously, we've got new leaderboard as well, so app usage leaderboard, and obviously, as clubs, you can log into the back end and check usage as well. So the club partnership's going strength to strength, and obviously, in the current climate, it's obviously becoming a, a necessity for clubs to have uh, some remote quality remote learning. So if you're interested in how um, the My Personal Football Coach Club partnership can take your club to the next level and give your your coaches and players some quality content uh, to keep them busy in the current time just drop me a dm obviously look we're we've, we're supporting clubs all around the world and obviously pro clubs as well and uh, obviously wolverhampton wanderers as a club has been on for several seasons now but uh, just hear what uh, the head of coaching john hunter barrett has to say about the my personal football coach club partnership at the moment hi everyone my name is john hunter i'm the head of coaching from wolves academy during the current crisis our players and our staff have been utilising the My Personal Football Coach app. This allows players to train at home with some guidance against a, a consistent technical development programme. It also allows our coaches to track the data and the usage of the players throughout this period. There is a platform on there that's built in for the players to upload and share their videos to a team library. That team library gets viewed by the other players and all the staff throughout the programme. It's definitely an app that we would strongly recommend. So there you go, guys. John Hunter. And uh, like I said, if you're interested in how it can uh, support your club, just drop me a line. We can set you up a demo account. And don't forget, we are offering almost 70% off, or well, up to 70% off the normal club partnership price as we, uh, we try and support as many clubs uh, as possible around the world. We're giving their players some quality and their coach some quality e-learning opportunities. So like I said, drop me a DM. We can set you up a demo account. Uh, but without, without further ado, let's get into the show. The legend, the man himself, uh, Chris Ramsey, the top boy when it comes to player development. So, uh, Chris Ramsey, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you doing? Can you just give just um, just give us an idea? Obviously, it's your second time on the show, mate. Just give us a, an idea about your. Uh, I'm interested in your coaching journey. So, in terms of tell us about your initial experiences of coaching and how you how you came to be where you are today in terms of your philosophy. Uh, well, when my con uh, coaching journey came about, um, came about by accident, really. I mean, I did my prelim when I was 21, um, and I failed it. And then I did it when I was 20. Well, when I was 20, and I failed it. And then I did it when I was 21. So, the the qualifications were a little bit more stringent in those days than they are now. Um, but I didn't coach, and then until I was about. 28, 29, 28, 
uh, when I'd finished in England, I went to Malta and um, I ended up being the player coach out there. Uh, but while I was there, I learned a lot of things. You know, I started coaching uh, like the reserve teams and uh, the youth teams and stuff like that. So I, I, but I was winging it really, to be honest with you. But, uh, you know, slowly but surely, a player coach is a very, very difficult job. Um, and I did three years there, but I was quite successful. You know, we got promoted and got to the cup final and stuff like that. And I ended up doing coming back to England and doing my uh, doing. We used to do prep courses in those days, and, and they were like uh, sessions you do just to get you ready to go on 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 the full badge. There was no B license in the, in those days back in the early nineties. Uh, there was there, there was no uh, B license. Uh, so I did a couple of prep courses, went back to Malta, and then I came back here to go to uni. Uh, when I came back and went to uni, I ended up, I did my full badge during that summer. But in the meantime, I was going to America uh, in the summers and I was coaching in America. And I, I learned a lot by doing the camps uh, because I, I took them quite seriously. So I learned a lot by doing that. I ended up uh, having another player, player coach's job out there in Cocoa Beach in Florida. So I did a lot of coaching in, 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 in America, uh, probably a good 10 years worth, to be honest. Um, but when I came back here, it's very, very difficult to get a job. Uh, you know, uh, couldn't couldn't get a job for love or no, no money in football. So I was at uni and uh, I started doing football in the community. Uh, I mean, just by coincidence, I, uh, QPR was one of my first football in the community uh, uh, clubs that I went to. Um, and I went there, I did QPR, Orient, Brentford, uh, Wimbledon. Um, so that's what I did really and, and I learned actually the most uh, about coaching doing those those roles because you can learn a lot about differentiating sessions um, learn a lot about uh, communicating with different age groups different at different times um, so that that's that was sort of like the backbone of my real coaching was, was that I, I, I would say and uh, so I did that um, and during that time, I coached Newham ladies as well, just when women's football was starting to become uh, taken more seriously. Um, you know, like now it's taken quite seriously. So it was an enjoyable um, introduction into women's football for myself. Um, so I did that for three years while I was working at Orient. Um, I became um, head of youth development, the youth development officer. Uh, there, so I worked there um, with um, Paul Brush, um, now Ozzy Abanji, um, which a lot of people do know. I bumped into him while I was at uni, and he actually introduced me to the to the people at Orient, um, where I did the football in the community. And fortunately for me, um, I met him and Grant Cornwall, Cornwall took me on. So I did that, but I was fortunate that Pat Holland, um, who's, who's a good friend of mine, um, offered me a job doing the one of the age groups. Um, and Steve Shaw, he was there. He was he, he was another person that was important at Orient at that time. And um, I ended up doing that with uh, with um, Paul Brush and Tommy Coleman, um, and, and it, it was very interesting there. Um, because we had nothing, not like now. Uh, Tommy Cunningham, sorry, not Tommy Coleman, Tommy Cunningham. We had we had nothing uh, uh, back in those days, and uh, Paul ended up going to be the youth team coach, and I took over the job as the youth development officer. Now, obviously, in those days, it's very difficult. You had to wash the kit, you had to to organise all the schedules. You, uh, the, the money was was uh, really really low. So, and what age groups did you have in there at that time? Uh, nines to yeah, nines to sixteens, um, and the the youth team didn't really come under the academy in those days. Uh, but I used to I played in the reserves as well at Orient in, at wow. that time. So so uh, so I was doing the uni and I was playing in the reserves and I was doing that job as well and I was doing Newham ladies uh, as well as football in the community to earn earn some money. Um, so, you know, when I employed people like Ozzy Abanji, he, he was there at the time, he, he, he was involved. So uh, there's a lot of people that I go back a long way 
with um, and um, obviously and I worked with Paul Brush with the youth team as well um, so what happened what happened to me then was along the way I'd go on a lot of courses a lot of courses and uh, the FA uh, sort of head hunted me uh, towards the end of my time at uni so as the head of the, what people won't realise is you'd be the, the youth development officer at Orient which would be seen as a massive full time job now but it, it was a full time job but part time pay so uh, so I did a full I was doing a full time university degree at the time at, uh, at North London University I was doing a teaching degree which I thought was very very important as regards teaching me about pedagogy and learning how people, uh, kids learn and stuff like that um, so that was that was a that was a you know we talk about coaching that was actually probably one of my biggest um, um, leg ups in, in understanding about coaching and, and teaching and, and stuff like that so um, during that time the FA um, before I finished my university degree they asked me to, to apply for some jobs at the FA um, one of them was um, being the uh, head of uh, the regional director for London and the South East. So that was a, you know, an, a, a, an unbelievable honour to, to be asked to do that, you know, with the FA. So basically what you're doing is you're, there were five regional directors in those days. And um, I was basically in charge of everybody in, in, in London and, you know, all the clubs like Brighton, Gillingham, Norwich, uh, Ipswich, all, all out towards Reading, all that way, way down. So in, nowadays you have loads and loads of people doing different jobs in in uh, in football, in, especially at the FA and places like that. In those days, it was only one or two. So you, you were in charge of the whole region yourself. You know, the scouting, the most of the CPDs were done nationally. So we'd have five a year in different in in all the regions, and everyone would help you. So. I ended up going to to work for the FA and uh, as Howard Wilkins' assistant with the England under 18s, um, and also uh, during during the time I was at Orient, I actually became a, tu a tutor uh, for the um, coach education. So Brian Talbot worked for the FA, for the PFA, and he asked me if if if, if I could uh, if if I wanted to come and be a tutor. In those days, it was different. Um, all the the now the the FA bring people to the clubs. They actually bring people to the clubs for the people to pass their badges. In those days, all the, the clubs used to to uh, come together. So, for argument's sake, you would have Arsenal, Barnet, and I don't know uh, Tottenham. They would all come together and in in one area, and the tutor would teach them all. So I, I worked with Brian doing that coach education, and he he actually helped me to to get on the road to coach education. Brian Talbot, um, he's a chief scout now at uh, Fulham. Um, so I ended up going to uh, to the FA, which was a massive, steep, steep, steep learning curve. Um, I was Howard's Howard's assistant. I met some fantastic people there. Uh, um, I mean, I knew John McDermott before that. I knew him from uh, I worked with him in America. But he worked at the FA at, at the time with uh, Kenny Swain and Dick Bate, who's one of my massive influence on, on me. Um, I think I've learned probably more from him than anybody else. Um, so let's, 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 let's just before we get there, because the reason I'm asking there, because I'm interested of the first time we met was when you were at Spurs, your assistant cabbie manager. And, yeah. um, you know, you've, you've gone into Tottenham and you've created a very unique philosophy so something very, very unconventional in the English term, if you like. So first, tell us about the philosophy at the club which you implemented, and then I'm interested in how you came about. You know, how did you come about to that, to that point? You know, with, with all your experiences, a very you know, English, you know, typical English education in the game, and you're you're um, you're basically, you know, you're 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 you're, you're providing this uh, very un-English sort of methodology, if you like. Uh, well, I uh, well obviously like a lot of people now. So it's, it's, it's just just different how you study the game. I mean, I was uh, influenced a lot by uh, Holland and German Germany 1974 World Cup final. You know where you had the total movement of of, of uh, the Dutch 
and then you had the discipline of the German team, but you also had flair in the German team in people like Beckenbauer. And uh, so, you know, I was only 12 when that happened, but, you know, my first World Cup I watched was uh, Brazil versus Italy in 1970. So those things were very sparing because the TV is not what it is like now, but I'm very influenced by, by that. And, um, you know, along the way it's about putting things together and understanding one what's required of, of players and, and obviously the style of play that you'd like to see so I'd had obviously my, my experiences of playing abroad playing in in, in, uh, in Malta in Malta I learnt a lot you know because I uh, they've got a they've got a, a national stadium called Tahali but in those days it wasn't as strict as it is now and a lot of Italian teams used to go and train there so I'd go and sneak in and watch uh, watch them and then slowly piece things together you know certain players have influenced me big time but certain teams have influenced me so my, my philosophy um, is a mismatch really of, of, of those, those two teams uh, the Colombian team but, uh, the, the, the Colombian teams that, that played with uh, Valderrama and Esprilla Esprilla uh, the Brazilian team of 1982 with uh, Socrates and Zico and um, you know, and, and just and just a, a mishmash of of, of uh, different styles of play, and try to make still make it unique to the English game, which is I think is important when you're a coach. You have to realise your audience, and you have to realise where you're at and and uh, um, who you're actually coaching for. Well, t- tell us a bit about that, then, Chris. That that philosophy a little bit more than in terms of practically. What does that look like then? For instance, the foundation phase. When you, I'm interested. When you went in there, what was your um, remit in terms of, you know, because obviously I remember I think our first conversation when you gave me the nines job was, you know, I don't want all this defending at corners, and uh, let's make it playground type football. And that was pretty much your, you know, just try and make it a lot about, you know, enjoyment, expression, get those sorts of, uh, you know, individuality out there. But I'm interested to understand how, you know, that's quite a... We were doing things then that no other club really in the country were doing in terms of that approach. So I mean, just how did you get there and what was your remit and things like that? Well, the remit, my remit was obviously to, uh, when, when myself and John McDermott went into the club, we were we were spending about 900000 I think, on the academy. And uh, we had a chat one day and we said, look, one thing that's going to happen is that, that in five years' time, the board are going to ask, well, where's our where's our money? Where's our four point five million, four point yeah five million, whatever it will be? So at some stage you have to get people in the team. But the the way things were at that time were it, it was very safe academy. You know, people playing uh, two touch, very neat and tidy football. But it didn't really lend itself to producing individuals at that time. So one thing we had to realise is that. When you've got players that, that 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 are not expressive or people that, that can't control it in the way that you want them to control it and see things that you want them to see, then you're just going to have a safe academy that probably wins every week but doesn't produce uh, players. So we 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 used to speak myself and John before I came back from America, and we used to talk about the individuals, about you know teams don't go into first teams, individuals go into first teams. So teams are there as a vehicle to help the, to help the individuals. So you have to make sure whatever happens when you play games that you, you've always got one of the best players um, on the pitch or maybe two or three of the best players on the pitch. The result, although we all think it's important, it really isn't that important. I mean, nobody wants to lose. Of course they don't. But at the end of the day, the, the, the board are going to ask you about the players. They're not going to ask you how the under-9s got on against, uh, I don't know, uh, another academy team. They're not going to ask you that. They're going to, ask, they're going to say, who's the next player? Um, who's the next player that can get in the team? Who's the next player we can sell? So it was important to get the players to be initially expressive uh, and initially have outstanding ball control um, and and have a bit of flair about them because then you can mould them. You can mould them from there. If they've got no no, uh, if their ball control and their their technique isn't top notch, you can't really mould anybody from there. But I mean, yeah, we're dealing, you know, very the conventional English style of coaching is very much maybe strike the ball, get rid of the ball, pass the ball quickly, as you talked about two-touch. So I'm interested, where, where did you, you know, where was your inspiration to say, okay, well, this is how I'm going to set up the foundation phase, for example. This, I want lots of ball mastery and 1v1, and this is what a session should look like. 
Uh, it was my own, really, because I thought that I thought that the more expressive a player is, the better the ball control, the 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 easier it is to play with less touches. So people think it's the other way around. It's not the other way around. The better your ball control, the, the quicker you can play, the the quicker you see things, um, the 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 more variety you've got in your in your attacking, um, and and I think without that, you 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 really building robots um, if people only play two touch when they're young and, and what's the main challenges about trying to implement a methodology like that which is very unconventional uh, very difficult because the, you have to really I mean with, I, I'm the head of one of my jobs at QPR now is head of coaching but I would have put, said put myself as head of coaching uh, in those days but the hardest thing is to convince others to convince others that uh, that this is the way to go, because um, as far as everybody he, he had seen, you know, like you said, it was pretty, it was pretty unique at that time for a lot of lot of coaches. So there was no evidence. There's no evidence that 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 worked for them. So trying to trying to get people to uh, to understand that this is the way that we we need to go was very difficult because. A lot of people would, would, would they'd be talking about your Barcelonas and uh, Real Madrids and teams like that and and I and I you know my, my uh, sort of mindset was you know people will be asking about Tottenham in ten years time people will be asking what happens at Tottenham uh, Perry Sutcliffe and myself used to talk about that and he you know and he, he reminded me of it you know we said that at the beginning top people we, people are going to be asked what's happening at Tottenham not what's happening at all these other places because. A lot of the times we go with these fads. Everything goes with a fad. So people talk about high fullbacks, interchange, and movement and stuff like that. You know, I implore people to go and look at some of the some of the the, the, the World Cups of the past. All right, we all talk about oh the game's quicker now, but no, the game's only as quick as the time that you're alive. So at that time, it would have seemed quick for those people then. Um, so lots of stuff that people think are new is, is not new. It's, it's just that they don't understand it or they, they, they haven't witnessed it. So trying to get more of a playground feel to, to uh, the, the foundation phase was important to, to try to get individual players and make sure that they could express themselves and be very rounded in their talent. And what about but some people confuse that uh, playground um, mentality with just letting them play? What's the difference between that and elite environment, or just letting them laissez faire stand back and letting them get on with it? No, because letting them just letting them play doesn't actually uh, doesn't actually uh, create excellence. Um, what you need to do is you let you you have to give them mediums that they can manipulate to express themselves. So you have to encourage them to. Uh, everything's based on strength anyway. So so you know the whole philosophy is a strength based. Uh, capability uh, philosophy so first and foremost you mainly work on what they're good at mainly now the only time you work on what on their weaknesses is if it actually affects their development if not you you solely work on what they're good at so that was a complete change in the way that people uh, talked about players because most of the time people will come back and tell you everything that someone can't do um, we didn't want that we wanted to make sure that when we sign somebody that they become better at the thing that we signed them for not not uh, average at the thing that we signed them for and average at the weakness so they end up being a, a rounded at being weak rather than uh, have uh, a, a, a super strength is that so, does that go for all age groups i mean even in the foundation phase groups. when you get in the eights and nines in you know you, is it you, you're still focusing on the, just the strengths all age groups but what there is is there's some generic things that people have to be good at regardless you know controlling with the ball on, on your furthest foot checking your shoulder um, running with the ball with your front foot down those all those sorts of all those sorts of things are generic things that you have to do regardless of the system regardless of the type of player there's generic things that you have to teach the players which is where people stand back and say oh yeah what we're going to do is let the game be the teacher the game can only be the teacher if you can play the game. 
And I, but I remember it, obviously um, Thursday nights was always game night, so you did have that balance. Thursday night was we did a half an hour technical and then an hour free games, different formats. So you yeah. still had that balance of the free play and also the the guided sort of stuff. Yeah, because what you wanted what you wanted was to to, to players to to look at what they've learned from the coaches and see if they could implement it along with their their own personality. So they could do. They're trying to implement their own personality within a formula that that, that we used to teach. Okay, and then what about what's the main challenges in terms of then getting your staff in, getting a, a staff who've been educated in a in a formal FA way, which is maybe not the way which you you've, you're doing things in this new unconventional sort of way. Uh, well, I mean, it's not just the FA way. It's mainly the way they've they've been they've been their experiences so the, the FA teaches you a structure of how to coach it's how then you manipulate it so the thing is at the end of the day the, 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 the biggest challenges are is that people they look they don't understand I mean uh, in one of my presentations I, I, I say unless you are one of the 92 in first team football and that means if you're if you're a sports scientist uh, a physio a coach a manager there's only 92 of those jobs. Now, anybody who falls outside of the 92 um, first team jobs in the country is in development. Every single person is in development. Now, it's trying to get people to understand that. So when they are coaching an under nine or an under 12 or an under 14, it's for them to understand where that person is on the development pyramid. And also that th these people are not finished articles and the free points isn't what you're trying you're trying to uh, achieve you're trying to achieve um a situation where the players become better and actually reach their their goal of becoming uh, a signed player in a professional club so the biggest challenge is, uh, is is the biggest challenge really is to get the players the coaches to understand that they are developers uh, but not developers by standing back and saying um uh let the game be the teacher because then we don't really need we don't really need coaches then do we there's no point in having a coach uh, what you what you do need is people that can guide people into um, in, into to, to reaching their potential and if the, if the person is struggling to reach their potential then they actually need to be told they need to be not told in a horrible way they need to be coached they need to be be the um, not their fault, but where that where they need to improve needs to be outlined. And what about the the opposite to that in terms of maybe coaching too much? So, for instance, you know, we heard of under nines teams, under nines coaches coaching, you know, defending as a unit for under nines and and that sort of thing. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't understand that. I really don't understand that because first and foremost, you don't sign when you go to scout a player. What's the first thing? If you're most young players who get scouted are forwards most you never go to a game and, and sign an under nine center half very rarely right so most most players that you sign you sign for what they do on the ball so until you've exhausted everything that they can do on the ball which should start filtering itself up as they get older um you, you know defending as a, as a unit why, why not defend as an individual why not teach them how to defend as individuals? But even at under nine, I don't understand why that, that would even matter. Because if you were to watch an under nines game, everyone's a defender because everybody just runs after the ball, don't they? So so that means they're all going to be fighting for the ball. Um, so that defending as a unit as un, in under nines, I, I don't understand why people do it. Don't understand it. And, and talk about a little bit then maybe sort of the older age, the, 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 end, the other end of the foundation phase, 11s and 12s. When maybe the pitches are getting a little bit bigger, how do you deal with that transition? How do you help the players, and how much is it playground like, and how much is it a little bit more formulated possession type? If that's if that makes sense. Well, I think along the way, as soon as you start getting because because we start playing with bigger pitches, say what at Tet Eleven, there's always going to have to be pitch pitch geography, so people know where they are on the pitch. And that's where you start looking at your movement experimentation, where people play in different positions, um, and and some of the drills that you do then, and some of the the, the games that you do, will will lend themselves to coaching 
unit work, individual defending, communication. So, so yeah, so you gradually start putting that in. You start, you start asking questions about what could you do here, um, how could you help your mate, that sort of stuff. When you're talking about covering and stuff like that, so the language you use is going to be important. So you slowly filter that into their game. And I mentioned as well, like because you talked about convincing people. What about convincing? How is it to convince parents? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, for instance, when we were there, we you know, Arsenal on our doorstep, very dominant in the area of recruitment, very much focused on winning, quite direct. Chelsea, other part of London, but also the dominant force in recruitment, big winning mentality focused. So, how do you convince the parents? Because we all know how important recruitment is. That actually is, you know, it's more of a long term. It's a long game rather than a short game. <sighs> Uh, well, you, you have to basically you have to look at it and, and uh, the parents getting the parents to understand is very very difficult because they want to win more than the kids. Um, but of, of, obviously, when you are looking at, for argument's sake, if you're looking at our club at QPR, first thing I always say to the parents is, we do not actually get the best pair of players when we recruit, not now. Not now we don't. I'm not saying the players will not become good players, but if the, if if the, if we were uh, Arsenal or Tottenham or Chelsea, they would go there first. They're not coming to QPR before that before one of those teams. So the fact that they're at our club means that they're not the best player in, in they're not the best players in in London. So for us then we have to coach and we have to get the uh, we, potential. We have to we have to really eke out the potential of a player. So at Tottenham at that time, like you said, a lot of the the the, the teams, the London teams, had slightly better, well, had a, a better recruitment engines than us. So their raw materials were better than our raw materials. So that means that that is even harder on the coaching field then, because you really have to to work with the players. You have to give them time, and you have to you you have to keep on trying to trying to um, push them towards the, the the highest level of their potential. So the parents are always, always difficult to, to deal with. But, you know, it's one of those things you have to you have to be patient and they have to be patient. And just come on to Tottenham then until we move on to QPR. Just just tell us about Ricardo Moniz when he was there. The first time I met you was when Ricardo was doing a session. And I mm. remember you, you saying uh, you were going to go have a, you have a beer after Ricardo and you just talk about football all day. That's, you know, that's your uh, release from football. Tell us about Ricardo's influence, and because I was at when I was at Ajax last year, they called him the best in the world, as the best skills coach in the world. Tell us a bit about his influence on on the academy at the time. Yeah, I mean Ricardo's he is the, he probably is the best skills coach in the world. I mean one of the things that, that Ricardo really helped me with is I had my own my own uh, program, uh, but he helped me polish it and he showed me some new things that that that, that were really important and his passion for the game. And and the way he, you know, we were very very sort of aligned in our thinking, uh, myself and Ricardo, and and I I, I thought one he was a fantastic uh, demonstrator, two he was a fantastic motivator, and some of the sessions he did were very innovative, uh, and they really really it, it, it was the timing couldn't have been better for what we were trying to do at that time, because just before he came. You know, we were talking about the individual stuff and people running with the ball and dribbling and all that sort of stuff. Um, he just came and reinforced it and, and, and added to it as well. So, uh, you know, we were very lucky to have him at that time. And then, I mean, looking back now and, and you know, almost all that sort of Will Cover type work is almost frowned upon now in a lot of, on a lot of circles. What's your thoughts on that in terms of how powerful it can be? Well, one of the things that I thought that, that Ricardo and myself and John and, and the other coaches did was any 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 of the stuff that was a bit gimmicky, we actually made it real to the game. So there was nothing there that we did that you couldn't use in the game. So, you know, like sometimes you go to a lot of sessions and you think, well, you'd never use that or you wouldn't be able to do that. We, we Everything that we did was related to actually be able to use the game so believe it or not when you go and see some of these uh some of this stuff on youtube we our version of of, of the skills were, were actually quite basic very basic weren't they 
they're very basic the skills then they're, they're not that flash the skills that, 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 that we've done but they're done at speed and they're encouraged to be used along with what the, the, the player has to offer as well so that so anything the player has to offer we're going to try and make that that good as well you know and, and let them um, add it to the programme I think that's the difference, isn't it? All the stuff we do or we've done, you know, it's it's game related or it's game it's movements from the game, isn't it? I know what you're trying to say we're yeah. not they're not like freestyle, it's about supporting players with those one v one centric movements specifically. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so, and, and, um, and also just just we John used to talk about a lot about trying to create Champions League players, I mean that that level. What what did that mean to you? What's what are the attributes of a Champions League player? Well, uh, one of the things that, uh, believe it or not, pe- people people think the attributes of a Champions, Champions League player has got to be they've got to be able to bend it and do this and do that and be unbelievable dribbler. Basically, have unbelievable basics, and, the, uh, and built on the unbelievable basics is the flair. So uh, it's one of those things pe- people people think that. It's just about dribbling, just about running with it, just about Cruyff turns and stuff like that. But all the top players, their basics are so honed that they can build their flair on that. So I think all the Champions League players or anyone, even at top level, their basics allow them to to build uh, the flair that they've got. OK, so we talk about sort of now you're at QPR. Talk about that initial time there. I'm interested. I mean, what was the differences in terms of the the basic contrast were coming from a Tottenham into QPR and obviously you've been trying to develop Champions League players at, at Tottenham is it is it a different mentality at QPR? Uh, when I first came it was the same as when I first joined Tottenham it was worse to be fair because they uh, their youth teams and uh, used to win they used to win win things and win win their their their, uh, their league and stuff like that so it, it was it was it was difficult. It's very very it was very difficult. Uh, but obviously the remit was the similar to the Tottenham's. But we had a twelve year journey at Tottenham, so we went from two thousand and five to two thousand and seventeen, and and you know you know we had lots of ups and downs, but things good things happened at, at the right time there. At QPR, you know it was almost trying to get see how quickly you could get an impact, um, and where we started from the from the bottom of the pyramid there where we were started mid pyramid at QPR uh, and obviously we were we, we had to recruit people from different clubs who rejects so similar to what we're saying at Tottenham we weren't getting the best players we were getting uh, players that nobody wanted and then what we what we're looking at then is how do we polish those players and get them into the first team but that had to be done quite quickly at uh, at QPR now one of the things which what helped at Tottenham was eventually uh, John was able to recruit the staff that he that he wanted, you know, your Alex Ingle Forbes and people like that who 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 could come and help the program. And you had Perry Sutcliffe there, and you know Richard Allen initially changing the the, the recruitment. So there was there's a there was a lot of people there that that uh, you know that came in and helped the program. Danny Buck. People like that, you know, uh, uh, Bradley Allen, Ozzie Banji. So you, you had good, solid coaches that were able to to be disciples for what you wanted, um, and that's what I've tried to do at QPR. Um, so you know, you look at you look at uh, our four senior coaches, you know, Paul Hall, Andy MP, uh, Micah Hyde, and Paul Furlong. You know, they're, they're good, solid disciples. They come in work in the evenings in in the academy. So uh, myself, Paul Hall and Andy Impey worked quite closely for, uh, you know, the first couple of years I was there. Uh, no, it was the first couple of years since I came back from doing the first team. And, you know, any given day, you know, I go and watch their sessions. I know what they're going to do. I know they can choose a session. I know what, what's, you know, how they're developing the players. And then it goes to show because... You know, we've ended up with being the third highest academy minutes last season. You know, with our, with our resources, so you need good disciples that are gonna gonna um, do the work all the way through the pyramid to pass the baton on to the next coach and the next coach and the next coach. 
So, um, so, when, so when you said like middle of the pyramid, did you mean that obviously you're getting older players and you've got to get them ready quicker? Is that what you mean? You had less time? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what my was that? Is that just the realities maybe of working uh, at a club like that, uh, that at that level? Just you need to make immediate impact. You don't have that ten year cushion. Cycle. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, you're not going to have a ten year. You're not going to be able to have a twelve year plan there. Uh, what you have is you have the twelve year plan, but you have to. We're not an academy. Listen, when when I first went to Tottenham, we were spending nine hundred grand. They probably along the way. They spend, you know, they spent more and more and more and more to, you know, as 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 they would have done. A big academy would evolve, the same as everybody else. QPR is hasn't got the resources of a Tottenham, uh, so whatever they was, whatever we were spending when I first came in, we're probably spending the same. So there's no going and buying a buying a kid. There's no there's no doing that. There's no, um, you know. Uh, Overnighters all the time for the youth team, you know that, that that's sparing. You know it's, it's not like that. Now I'm not saying that that um, that's the be all and end all, but that's the reality of being a QPR. Um, but I believe that the staff, the staff that I've got, especially at the top end, uh, have been unbelievable in their in their uh, in taking on. Um, the philosophy that, that has been brought to the club and doing it to the T, and then the results have, have, have shown themselves. So not only not only is the philosophy been able to work at uh, Tottenham, it's, we've moved it to another club. I've moved it. I, I, I've moved. I've, I've moved. It. I'm not saying that Tottenham. You know, obviously with John John McDermott would be continuing um, at, at Tottenham, but it's it's a development philosophy that we believe works. Uh, uh, was it what, what I mean? Were there any other challenges involved in trying to implement that same philosophy at a, at a different club? I mean, and what about the foundation phase, for example? Yeah, because the coaches don't believe you, so they do their own thing when your back's turned. So you know, uh, and, and then you have to get rid of them because they've got no evidence that what they're doing works. But I've got evidence now. Like right? I said to you when I first went to Tottenham that nobody could see the evidence. The only evidence I had was what I did at Orient because at Orient, we played the same. In night, in the, when, I, when I went there in 1994, we tried to play the same. We had people like Nicky Shorey, people like that, who ended up going to play for England. So that was, that was, a, that was a, the initial start of the individual programme. Myself, Paul Brush, people like that. We used to do, uh, you know, we talked about that even back then. Um, and we used to, we used to get murdered, but we used to get players signed and 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 into the team. So when you look back, when you look back then, you know you're looking at a philosophy that's that's been dragged all the way through and evolved through that time. And uh, and, yeah. and what and what about so recruiting now? How, what do you look for when you're recruiting coaches, and how how do you go about it? It's very difficult because you have to do an open recruitment, um, and you first, first and foremost, you want to know what their philosophy is or what they think of development. So it's not about. See, people think development is about a system of play. It's not a system. It, 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 it's a style and, and and an ethos. That's what development is. And so you 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 have an ethos, and then you use a style of play to develop it. Uh, so. People will tell you about yeah what we'll do the low block and the high block and the, the Gagan press and the this and the that, but why and what it, they don't understand. You're trying to teach players how to play. So, you know, I have a saying. You know, Basildon, Basildon to Barcelona. If you're a centre half and you play for Basildon, you still have to head it. You still have to stop the turn. You still have to to cover round. If you play for Barcelona, you still have to do the same. So there are basics that every position has to do, regardless who you play for. So a lot of the times, uh, the coaches are about themselves. They're about tactics. They're about, oh, we played, a, we, you know, we were losing, so we changed the system. We, you know, they don't understand that, that. So what if you win the games? And what? So what? So what? Did okay. you have the best? Did, you know, that's the main thing. And um, and what about being in that environment now? So being clubs coming in and and. Uh... Buying your your best players and taking your best your best talent. Well, that's going to be a big 
problem for football for the smaller clubs because we have, we've sold two or three players that have gone to other clubs that probably would have played in our first team. But there's not much you can do when their contract ends and their parents want them to go to the bigger clubs because they 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 believe that because you've got a bigger badge, you've got better coaches. But I'm telling you now that, that some of our coaches could work anywhere in the world. Interesting. And what, what do you think about long term about that then? I mean, more and more clubs are, you know, doing a Brentford, if you like. Is that a reflection of that tough sort of environment for, for smaller clubs who are overshadowed by Cat One Academies? Uh, it could be. It could be. I mean, a lot of clubs are doing it for financial purposes. Um, and then people, there's no, I mean, I think people are just trying to find the right formula to, to produce players because there's a lot of uh, talk about the under 23 league not being real football, not being, um, you know, not being um, a, a platform to help players um, get on in, in, in the real world. So I think people are going to try different things. I think uh, the fact is now that the most you can probably play for somebody if they've been at your club you know, since they were nine, it's probably 300,000. And I think for a lot of clubs, big clubs, that's just a punt. They don't, you know, they're probably no one's even accountable for that. So a lot of clubs will lose players. Um, and maybe those players might be better off staying in, in their, in their, uh, in their original clubs. However, you know, you can't blame somebody who's got a child who's who might be a single parent and they've got other other children and they've got to bring the child to training four times a week. You know, when they can go to a bigger club that will probably um, help them to get the club the 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 um, the player to the club uh, three or four times a week and probably um, offer them some expenses as well. You can't blame them, can you? Really. And so a couple of questions here that some of the listeners have given. You've talked a lot in the past about that individual needs, um, individual uh, individual strength-based coaching. You mentioned it earlier. I saw you in, in Geneva when we both presented there. That you, yeah. and you that thing. Tell us a little bit about that and what does that look like in, in actual sessions? How do you deliver that? Well, you have to set your sessions out in a way that you know what every player is going to get out of the session. Um it's pointless. It's pointless just doing the session for the sake of doing the session so that it looks good on you. You're you're coaching for the players. You're not coaching for yourself. So sometimes people are more worried about how the session looks than what the players have learnt learnt from the session. And before the session, you should know what players are going to get out of the session or what their individual plans are. So what we tend, what we do is we have some stock sessions that everybody has to do, and. Uh, there's no, there's no. I know a lot, a lot of coaches will say, "Oh, well, you're taking away my flair," but uh, I, I don't agree with that. You, everybody has to do the same sessions at our place. Uh, so is that is that is that from nines to sixteens? Everyone. Well, th- everybody does the same sessions. Um, I wouldn't say they they would do the same sessions age related, basically. Right. Age related, it's the same way. If you go to uh, a university and do an, a, an English degree. You wouldn't be doing the same work uh, in the infants, but you'd still be doing English. So, so, so then, give us a, give us an idea. Then, what what are the, some of those things that the the coaches have to do? For instance, what's a typical under nine session look like at QPR? A typical under nine session. Well, they'll probably start off with uh, a ball each. Um, they might do. You know, we we do a lot of a lot of uh, ball manipulation stuff. So they probably go ball each. There'll be different things they'll, they'll do, uh, ball manipulations. We, we have names for everything that they do. Uh, then they'll probably go ball between two. Um, and then we might do something where we, we add uh, three people. And then we might do a skill practice and then they'll do a game. But they'll do the game that, 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 that we've prescribed for them to do. So was that like a condition game? Well, they might do a four-goal game. They might do a game where, well, well, mo- the younger they are, the freer it is. So what we'll try and do is, if we're working on ball striking, we might encourage them to strike the ball earlier, or or try not to be so safe, or something like that. But we'd probably look at each player, and and we'd probably be 
have an idea of what we think that they're good at when they come in. And if they're not doing that, if they're not dribbling, then we would encourage them to dribble. If, they, if we brought them in for, for, for that and they weren't doing it, we would try to make sure that they're doing it. So at the end of every six weeks, we do the reviews. Uh, but we do them every two, instead of the, them doing the PMA every every day now they do it every two weeks and I'm looking to see where the players are going during that time so at the end of six weeks either they've improved or they've improved on something that we've outlined that they need to improve on or not but a typical under nine session is quite messy with us try to to, to, to get the players to, to enjoy it like they would do in the playground and what about like a 12 session under 12 session under 12 session, you're sort of more looking at them now understanding the pitch geography about where, about you know, there are things more, more uh, adult like themes as regards the way the game's being played, about the pivot play, about getting the ball into the midfield, getting people to, 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 to get it on the half turn, and uh, different types of passing, different. Um, we're expecting them to execute outside of the boot passing, reverse passing, stuff like that. We're expecting that to be not more polish, but we but to see that they 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 understand how to use these different things, uh, and then, and obviously the unit work becomes a little bit more pronounced when they move up the pyramid. Uh, it's not going to be perfect, but so so tell us what what do you mean by unit work? Well, things like if you're uh, like the midfield rotation, midfield rotation. So they're to understand how they work with other players, off other players. So if somebody comes short, where do you go? You know, somebody comes off the line, do you go around them? That, that type, you know, that sort of thing. You start to get their bit of game understanding in that in that way. And what about like a 16 session? What's that going to look like? 16 session will just be a watered down version of the 18s. It would just be that, that by then I'm expecting them to know quite quite a bit. I'm expecting them to play properly, really. To, so you know, give, us, give, us, give us a little taste. I, I'll but... take that back. I don't mean properly. I mean, I expect them to really understand their role, and what they'll be doing now is is, is trying to get better at their at their at their role. So, if you're looking at uh, you know uh, a centre forward, you know playing with his back to the goal, how how he controls it, he needs you know how how he he, he sits into somebody, things like that. So to tell us then the 16s, if I'm not watching a 16 session, what sort of thing am I going to see? You, you were quite explicit with the uh, the nines, you know, one ball each, one ball between two, between three, maybe. If I'm, what's the 16 session going to do? No, you see the same. <laughs> you see the same, but it just be we would just expect them to be more polished, more polished than than, than the under nines. We see the same. It'd be similar, but we probably wouldn't do crossing and finishing with the under nines. We probably we probably wouldn't expect midfield rotation with the under nines. We probably wouldn't expect uh, when we're defending to be swarming the ball and playing out of the melee with the under nines. It's slightly different, but the initial introductory practices are all, all the same. And I'm interested to know, like with the older boys, particularly, how do you encourage and coach that individual brilliance, that flair in those in that the older the older players and. You know, because so much now is possession-based practices. You know, when do you when do you step in and want courage, or how do you cultivate that individuality? Because if they're boring, if the play is boring, then you just tell them it's boring. You got to start running with it, and you you got to give them the platform to make mistakes. And you've got to so you're given the platform to make mistakes. Then you know you give them two or three, uh, or not two or three. You give them a period of time where they may be that they're choosing the wrong thing and then you have to coach them. This is where coaching this is where coaching is now um, gone backwards. People don't coach people. Someone makes a mistake or someone is uh, choosing the wrong time to run with it. There's no coaching. Nobody's, everything's unlucky. Oh, that was unlucky. It's not unlucky. It's bad play. As they get older, it's bad play. It's unlucky when they're 10. It's unlucky when they're 11. It's not unlucky when they're 18. So, so some some of the times people don't coach because one, they probably don't know, they don't know uh, what to say. Two, one of the, the 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 biggest things that I've seen is people don't know how to coach techniques. They don't they don't understand about techniques. They don't understand if you was to if you take a lot of coaches now. Well, right now I'm not having to go all young coaches. 
But a lot of the young coaches that you get now, if you ask them to demo clipping a ball, they probably couldn't do it. Or if you ask them to break down the teaching of clipping a ball, they, they, they would find that very difficult. And I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that as all coaches, but I'm saying that on, 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 on I would say, the vast majority of the coaches that I've met uh, recently. And, um, and that's our club as well. It's not, it's not, I'm not pointing the finger at any club. So why, why, do think, why do you think that is? Because I just don't think people, I don't think coaches think it's, in, it's, it's important to learn how, how to, to, co- uh, how to uh, coach techniques. And uh, they don't realise that most things break down because of poor technique. Most goals are scored because of poor technical defending. Most goals are missed because of poor technique. Um, most turnovers because of poor control. You know, you think to yourself, do they coach players to check their shoulder before the ball comes? Do players uh, Can players check their shoulder without the ball bobbing over their foot because they've looked away from the ball too long? Things like that, that they, 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 a lot of coaches don't coach that now. Yeah, but I suppose if you're, you know, if you you come through doing your licences and they're saying stick them in a game and you know the techniques will come out, probably maybe that's that's why that's that's a difference. Just you know, where we've gone from a break it down and coach technically to maybe more game based approach. Maybe that's why there's an there's that information gap. Well, yeah, listen, you don't want to be too too much uh, stopping it. You don't want to stop it, but no one ever stops it ever. Now I I I'm telling my coaches to, to help the players. So what you do is you have a lot of coaches just stand on the side and let the game flow. Well, why do you need a badge to do that? You don't need a badge to do that. Then what's the point? You can get anybody. You can get a parent to do that. And, and so you, you're, you've been fortunate enough to work. You're working with the nines all the way to the first team. Yeah. Now you're working with these first team players, and you've done in the past. What are the what what's the major takeaways that you which makes you reflect on maybe what the work what's important in the foundation phase, for example. Well, I work with I work I, I work with the first team players now sometimes. Yeah, I know. So I'm saying you kill working with them. So what's so you know what's what was the major takeaways? You know, for instance, you know what's the continual things that you 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 notice that thinking you know, maybe does anything you think make you want to change things or adapt your workings or things are more important? No, because the first team players need just as much technical work as anybody else. What the problem is is that first team players think that they don't. So. They don't work technically. If you look at it, it's, uh, they don't work as technically as as the rest of the academy, uh, as, as everybody else. So the players that do, so when we work with a lot of the young players, when you work with the first team players, you, the, you know, uh, a couple of seasons ago, we used to do clinics. Um, and anyone who was like a youngster that was in the first team squad used to have to do it in the afternoons. Um, so I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change I wouldn't change any. I'd, I'd probably, if anything, I'd probably be more forceful about it. My, my, Miles more forceful about it, because if you look at if you look at even clubs when they're getting when they're uh, the clubs at the bottom that lose games, you watch any game any game in the Premier League, someone will mess up technically. Why the other team scores? It's not usually a lot of the times people give away goals because they've tried to force it into midfield because of poor game understanding or not only that it's a poor technique they've sliced the clearance and someone scores so people don't tend to think that they need to work on 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 basics so um you know it's just things like that you know you see a player uh, open up to bend the ball um to have a shot and it goes over the bar and they miss and then you think well how many times they have they actually practice that probably probably never and then what happens is they think they'll just pull it out in the game. Doesn't happen like that. So um, I wouldn't. I don't know if there's much I would. I would change. But in, if, what, what about done. then working with first team players and how much? How how much can pros improve? You know how it's important for them to carry on working on their on their technique. You mentioned it there. So you know that player farmer. You know that that player needs to cut inside and bend it. So how much time should they spend? What refining their their techniques and are they given the time to do that? Well, I don't know if they're always if if in a lot of you know a lot of first teams people are given the time to it because you've got the sports scientists now saying oh uh, 
they've done their loading. So maybe it might be that, that as coaches, we need to build that work into it. So for argument's sake, one of the things that, that, that if you were, say, with Paul Hall and Andy Impey, if you're working, if, if we want to do shooting, then the people that shoot, that will be their session, will be shooting. It won't be, oh, we've got to do five a side and then after you're going to do shooting as, as an add-on. What it will be is what is what's your job? Your job is finishing in the six yard box, or your job is arriving at an air post. So that's going to be your session. So your session is your job. Not everybody does a generic session. Then we do we have a game, and at the end we're saying right, we're going to do a few shots. So it's about making sure that their session is their is is uh, refers to their job. Um, so you, so so therefore you wouldn't need to do extras because you've already done it. You've already done the session, and then the five aside becomes the extra. Yeah, it's interesting, I suppose, because I mean a lot of feedback I get from from parents, academy players who work want to work with me is that they're just they're not getting doing much individual stuff. It's very much possession rondo based, for instance. You know that's sort of yeah. very much what everything do you know in a whereas foundation or the YDP, and there's very little you know individual one v one ball mastery that sort of thing. Do you think that's quite, you know, that's a sort of common theme in academy football? Yeah, I think it's a common theme, but I think coaches want to do that because they want to coach for themselves. They don't want to coach the player. They want to coach the group. They want to coach tactics. They want to coach the low block and the high block and the, the medium block and this and the half space and all the new words. That's what they want to do. I suppose as well is that it's how they judge success, right? I mean, so their their success is well. We played on the we played you know Team X on the weekend. We popped them off the park. Blah blah blah. You know, two 0 win. Yeah. And we look really pretty. That sort of thing. I suppose is how do you measure success in the program? Well, the thing is, at the end of the day, you have to look at your club. You have to look at your club philosophy. You have to look at how you're going to get people in the team. So, for argument's sake, we've had in the last five years we've had seven managers so how adaptable do you make the players you have to make them adaptable so just getting them to pop the ball doesn't mean that they're going to they're, they're going to be successful pretty football doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be successful so we have to make what 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 we have to do as coaches is make sure if we've had seven managers in in five years and we had say someone like uh Darnell Furlon, he played for every manager, so he's he's so he's been adaptable since I've been there. He's he's played for every manager, so he's been able to change the style, of his style of play, every time. Now that's what that is that is your utopia. When someone brings your brings their their kid in under nine, they want longevity in the game, so they may not play for Man City or they may not play pretty football, but they need to know how to do both. Now, it's easier to go from pretty football to, to ugly football than to go from ugly football to pretty football. So if, you, if, you're just, if you're just used to clipping it into the channels and that's, that's your strength, if you change the manager and he wants you now to reverse it into midfield or to run with it or to overlap and dink it to the far post, you haven't got that in your armoury. So it's better to have everything in your armoury and then you can manipulate it to suit the managers that come in. So you've got everything technically in your armory and you've got the movements that are required tactically in your armory. You've got more chance of staying in the game. I mean, and so, so how, what's success to you? How do you judge if you've been successful? Uh, well, the club will judge by the players that, that, that get in the team. But obviously the club has got an ethos now that they want that to happen because we're not financially blessed. So for me, success for me for a player is how far we got him up, how far we reached into his potential and, and, and where did it take him. So if you look, if you look back now and you look at uh, from when we started in 2005 with, with, with the, the project at Tottenham, no, forget the players that have played in the team, that have played in the team. You've also got players that are playing in League One, playing in the Championship, playing abroad, um, pl players that have played in the World Cup. So it's not just about the players that are obvious. It's about the players that are less obvious, the players that have... Because the, the main thing is when you start off, our job is to get them 
you know, we have the aim that we always put up, which is get them in, in the team that you're working for, which, um, or next, either a team that's higher or similar. And then next is salaried football. If you can get them into salaried football, you've succeeded. That Because when someone comes in, that is what they want to be. Their dream is to be a footballer. That that That's the main thing. So if they don't actually play for the team that you're at, but they, they're, they're earning a living playing football, then technically you've succeeded. Technically, you succeeded. Now, if you've not reached the, the potential of that player, then that's a different matter. But your first thing is to get them into salaried football. And what, I remember having a conversation with Dan Machici once when he was in e- at England. Um, where I was there on a course and he said, we we're talking about different players from different clubs and he's, he, you know, he, someone said, you know, is there, do you play, can you tell certain players come from certain clubs? And he went straight away, yeah, I can tell a Spurs player. And he was talking about the, the way they moved and the way they were with the ball. Does that make you proud? Does that make you sort of think, yeah, that's what I want. I want people to understand, to see, yeah, that's a, you know, that's a player that's come from a philosophy that I've implemented. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I want. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like that. I'd like that, especially. But well, most of the midfield players you can, it, you you'll see because most of our our premise for all all our players is that they have midfield attributes. So what we try and do is everyone's a midfield player, and then we mould them into what we what we want. So, so why so why is that? Because they're te- they're all technically very good. They can do all the technical errors, and then the other things come as a after that. Yeah, if you if you if you if you look at someone who's an eight, an eight is usually quite rounded, right? An eight an eight is usually quite rounded. Can run, can pass it, can receive it, uh, can do most things. But the characteristics of that player decides whether they're going to be a ten, or 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 a two, or a five, or a nine. So we want everyone to have the the, the qualities of an eight, but. That obviously, we can manipulate that that player. Um, so, for, for argument's sake, if everyone had the qualities of a ten, then you, you, it's difficult to manipulate them to different positions because they're usually a ten is usually a forward thinking player. Whereas, if you have an eight, and you can have an eight who's a forward thinking player, you might become a ten. You can have an eight who's more a defensive type player, might become a two or a five or a six. But we want them all to be able to play. In, in, we want them to play possession football. If they, we don't want someone to say, "Oh, he's got a good touch for a big man." We just want him to have a good touch. End. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and and tell us just like how important that work with the ball is, that ball mastery for like in proving players moving. I've always said it like when you, you can tell. That's what I say. You know, I can tell a players in the a foundation phase player does a lot of ball mastery. Just the way they move, they move a little bit differently in terms of their agility and their coordination with the ball. I mean. How important is that that sort of functional, specific work with the ball? Well, it, it, it sets them up for everything. It sets them up for everything. You, like, you don't want to produce, you know, uh, uh, tanner ball players who, who, who just look good on the ball. But you want, to, you want them to have functional ability that they can use. So it's, you don't just want them to be people that can juggle a thousand juggles, but they can't actually do anything. You want them, it's very, very important. And... You know, one of the things that, that, that's been a big debate is people talk about uh, players should be able to play with both feet. You know, and it's something where I think unless they start really, really early, I don't think that that's re- realistic. I don't think that's realistic. But to be two-sided is different to be two different than being two-footed. So two-sided, two-sided means that you open out on both sides. But, but two-footed unless you start really early, it's difficult to be a master and, and uh, two-footed. Now, people, there's always going to be the odd person who people say, yeah, but so-and-so was two-footed, but most people are not. But I mean, so, but you want proficiency on the on the weak foot, is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on, on the wooden side, you want them to be able to at least do the passes that, that are required. Now, you're not asking them to play, you know, a, a 30-yard pass. With, with their on on their on their weak side on their let's say developing side you wouldn't want them to do that it, well you would if they could but the amount of time you're going to have to spend developing that you might as well develop their 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 strengths and just a couple of more things Chris I know you're you're a very busy man even in lockdown uh, just what about um you mentioned uh, pedagogy, pedagogy earlier because you've yeah. you've been at university what's your thoughts then on the current 
you know, games to teach a climate and skill acquisition and everything must be high contextual interference environment and in some from someone who's, you know, obviously very experienced in the game but also, you know, it, it's been through the education route as well. The game being the teacher, you could you it's like anything, you can it's, it, I don't understand it. The game can only be the teacher if you can play the game, and then you get better at the game. If, if someone throws you into a, into the river and you can't swim, what you're going to do is just say, "Well, you'll you'll learn to swim." You can't. So, the game can only be the teacher when you can play the game. So, first and foremost, the kids will learn the game by themselves, obviously, because they 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 play. But as they start to learn different things you can help them to be better at the game that's all that's all that is you help them to be better at the game once they play the game you can leave them and then when you want them to be better at the game you have to implement different things don't you so yeah. so for our sake the under nines their games are less structured but they're learning to run they're learning to move they're learning to avoid people they're, they're learning a lot of different things once they once they start getting to a point you want them to be better at the game, if they can't control the ball because all they're doing is just running around, then they won't stay in the game very long. And, and don't forget, one of the things that we try and do is we're trying to make people eventually into professionals, aren't we? That's what we're trying to do. So if people can't control the ball properly, they won't reach their goals. Now, if they're playing just to enjoy it, by all by all means, by all by by, by all means. I mean, we play PlayStation, and lots of kids learn how to play PlayStation uh, by playing it and playing it and playing it. But look how many hours they do that for. And, you know, when when uh, when I was younger, you know, you know, I grew up. I was born in the sixties, so when I grew up, people played in the street for hours and hours and hours. Um, but when you came into a professional football club, people still taught you how to how to cross the ball. They taught you defending. They didn't just say get on with it. You know what I mean? They taught you about movement in 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 midfield. They taught you about running across at the near post. They taught you about how, uh, different ways of striking the ball. Um, you did one one v ones where they would teach you about different you know dropping your shoulder, uh, running past people. How, how to chop the ball back, how to pass it. So, if it was just about about letting the game be the teacher, there would be no need for any coaches. And and what about now? Then you, you like I said, you've got an unbelievable track record now of getting players in the first team. Does that mean uh, you can just kick back and relax? The pressure's off of it, and it's a uh, big cigar time. Or how do you, how do you you know keep that momentum going? Uh, well. You have to. I think when you are a developer, you're you, you're a local parentis, aren't you? You have to see every child that comes in as your own, as if it's your boy walking through the door. And every time you speak to that child, you think, would I speak to my child like that? Would I do that? Would I? What would I expect from my child? And no matter how good that player is, he's still someone's child that you're you're look you're looking after. So you have to give your best all the time for those for those for those players and then you have to have you know we talk about egos those people say oh you've got to have no ego no you do have an ego your ego is to make sure that that child gets to where that child needs to get to that should be your ego your ego shouldn't be about whether qpr can beat arsenal's under the 12s and i'm sitting at the pub saying you know we we beat them your ego should be you know what we played whatever team it was and we had three of the best players. That should be your ego. Um, usually it's the other way around. Usually people would rather win the game than have the best players. So I can't sit back. One, I've got coaches to develop that, are, that are, uh, I want them to, to have the passion to develop players. And, and, and two, we're, you know, we're, we're sort of halfway through a, a project to, to make us the best in the world. So ultimately, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. So is that your ambition to be the best academy in the world? We are the best academy in the world. All right. So what, it is, is that, what, it, what it is is that people will not see it because what they see is a building 
and facilities. So if we was to change our building and our badge and had our same record, people would say that. Well, well that's what they would say. So everything's relative. Yeah. So everything, everything, everything's relative. I'd put our philosophy up against anybody's. So, you know, and, and, and I can say that now after how many years um, and and the track record that, that the clubs have had. But what people only see is they see badges and facilities and that's what they believe is is good is a good club um a lot of parents only see that a lot of parents believe the bigger the badge the better the coaches so you know and that doesn't necessarily mean that uh they're going to get what they need you know i always say to parents whenever you go go anywhere look at staff before you look at at the badge so if you you know who's to say uh you know barnet have just shut down you know we should you know people should go and grab their coaches because you know what they produce players they do brilliant there you know if you charlton go there charlton got the best the best record of any club in 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 the country for, for getting players into their team but people won't see that what they'll just see is the badge all right their facilities are good but do you understand what i mean people will just see the badge yeah. they won't say you know what what's been their record over the last years you know um so having the best having the philosophy that i believe is as good as any as, as any as any drives me um uh, to keep working the philosophy and it's not about uh, people say well you know how have you changed it no it's not changing it I'm just going to keep working it and making it evolve it but i'm not changing it it's the same as it was when we when i walked through the door at tottenham in 2005 philosophy is the same it's just moved with the times that's all you do you just move your philosophy with the time you don't change it yeah because i mean i when i was at your qpr a couple of months ago i saw you you're working with the under nines i mean then obviously the same day you're working with the first team you're working with the 18s i mean when when and when do you get the time to shut off and what do you do when you're not working or coaching uh it's it do you know what one of the one of the weaknesses of wanting every kid to make it is that you're going to lose you don't have a lot of time for yourself but um it's 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 not good that isn't a good thing to 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 do as a coach i think one of the things that you need is energy so when you're working with the under nines you probably need more energy than when you're working with the first team so i think that that is if i look at that as a weakness because you you have to be up for it coaching the under nines it's, it's probably the, the most demanding of the jobs because if you want them to be good or you want them to have energy they will model you have to model that energy with with with, with the young kids so um understanding them is important so you know when i get time to myself you try and understand the different age groups you start to try and understand what they watch on telly you start and talk to people of their own, you know, my nieces and nephews that are young and just try to relate to them. So when you go to, re- to, to coach the kids, you can relate to them. So you have to be, you have to be really obsessed with it to a point, you know? Um, but I mean, my main passion is fitness. To be honest with you, I'm probably better at fitness than I am at football. So um, I read a lot of anatomy and physiology and stuff like that. So how are you keeping fit now in the, in the lockdown? Uh, I've got, oh, luckily, uh, our academy manager and our, one of our analysts, uh, Alex Alex Carroll and Bar- Bartak, they, they uh, just before the lockdown, they were kind enough to bring me a bike, a bike from the, uh, from the academy. So oh, right. I've got a bike inside. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, been an, it's been obviously a very difficult time for everybody. So I'm I'm very very fortunate. I'm very fortunate. And what about long term then? I mean, what's what would you like to do apart from you know what, what any any anything aspirations you have um, post working in academy football, working at QPR? Would you like to work in the federation level or something like that? Uh, well, listen. Look, one of the best coaching times I had was working with Les Les Ferdinand and Tim Sherwood when we had a, a, a very very good development squad at 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 Tottenham, which was really enjoyable to coach and really enjoyable, uh, really good success with them. Uh, 
I'd like to probably get to a situation like that again that's just very pure coaching really um, but in reality I think my next move would be obviously uh, going to a federation really and doing the same thing with a federation um, the, the, the problem is time's running out because I'm you know getting to that retirement age soon do you know what I mean so um, hopefully I can finish the project at QPR um, which we're uh, uh, four years into or five years into um, so hopefully we, I can get another four or five years at QPR and finish the project um, but if not you know it's my 42nd season so I'm hoping to you know try and get to 50 seasons if I can Chris thanks very much mate it's been first class cheers, cheers. hopefully I'll, I'll speak to you soon thanks for tuning in to the mypersonalfootballcoach.com soccer player development podcast MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's dynamic ball mastery program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.